How different is Japanese breakfast Michelle to author Michelle? Author Michelle is like smarter and more like sober. <laughs> After my mom died, I went to therapy for a, a few months and I had a cold hard look at myself and was like, is if you spent this copay, on just like a bunch of groceries or like a really nice lunch, like would that be more <laughs> healing for you? And found that when I went to this grocery store, it was sort of unlocking these memories of my mother before she got sick. Michelle, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to have you on our book club. I, I absolutely loved your extraordinary memoir, Crying in H Mart. I mean, it was so moving but at the same time laugh, laugh out loud funny and I feel like some of the stories that you tell are so hilarious and it's and it's warm and it feels like it tells this real really kind of universal story between a mother and a daughter relationship and I think there are like three things in life that I'm totally obsessed with and that's books music and food so I think I'm really gonna enjoy this conversation um with you but before we jump in um can you give us a quick summary of what crying in h mart is about growing up um with a korean american mother and american dad uh and the sort of um tumultuous relationship i had with my mother and and korean culture in some ways um and losing my mother to cancer when I was 25 and the caretaking process that went into that when she we discovered she had cancer um, and how I sort of learned how to cook Korean food in the wake of her loss as a way of um, conjuring memories of, of her and my childhood and uh, sort of reconnecting with my culture. And I understand that you're in Korea right now. How is um, how's that going? How long are you there for? I'm here for a year. I'm working on my second book. And my mom always told me if I lived in Korea for six months to a year, she thought that I could become fluent. And so I kind of wanted to put that to the test. And um, I was feeling sort of burnt out after it feels really insane to say this to you. But uh, I was feeling really burnt out after the last touring cycle. And uh, I just needed a break and my publisher offered me like a second book deal. And so I decided to to kind of take put that to the test and and go to school for a year. And it's been very humbling. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, the, the, the touring schedule is grueling and I feel like you feel like you miss out on sometimes real life or hang out with your friends and um, with your family. And it's cool. How, how's the language? How's the language learning going? Uh, it's so tough. I mean, every other day I... You have like these small wins that are really exciting and you're like, oh, there's going to be no problem in achieving some sort of fluency by the end of the year. And then like the past couple of weeks have been have been really tough. I think like advancing from beginner to intermediate and like um, forming like fluid sentences uh, and just like constantly forgetting things all the time. Like it's sort of like mm. you're in this constant state of like when you have an argument with someone and you wish like an hour later you're like oh that would have been the perfect thing to say it's like that all the yeah. time with every single conversation <laughs> in your life where you're like why didn't I use like this grammatical arrangement of things or like I know that word like where did it go it's like constantly like it's like that awful feeling when you're like I know what like capricious means but I like can't remember it right now but with like 30 40 50 words a day it's really really <laughs> challenging <laughs> totally I mean learning learning a new language is is so is so difficult I um I know what you mean I feel like while I was on tour I was like oh let me try I'm gonna learn a bit of Spanish and then I was like I'm gonna learn a bit of French and it's always like that either trying to like finish sentences in a different language Michelle I was wondering um how's Peter your husband adapting to this adventure <laughs> is he also learning the language like it must be interesting to also see Korea through his eyes yeah it's really sweet it's so funny because I thought that most people when we moved here their first question would be like what about the band like what about your life mm. like what like all these questions and the first question that everyone asks is always like how's how's Peter <laughs> like what is he doing <laughs> um 
Uh, yeah, he's good. I mean, it's really wonderful. He's also working on a novel, and um, you know, we're very like easily entertained by the indoors and our <laughs> imagination. So he's adjusting. He's like making friends. He's very. Uh, we just had his birthday party a couple of weeks ago, and it was really fun to see like all our Korean new Korean friends come out and uh, nice. adjust to the life. And yeah, he's doing really good in Korea. They have something called Hagwon, which is like a private like learning institution, and For a yeah. couple of weeks, we went together just like getting the basics down, and so we sort of regressed into like teenage dating, <laughs> like going to like walking to school together and getting to experience that, and like watching each sweet. other do homework. So sweet, because you guys have been together for a long time, so it must be fun to have like a whole new experience to share with each other. For those of us not familiar with it, what is H Mart, and why is it more than just a supermarket to you? Yeah, H Mart is um, a small grocery chain, which is usually located um, in cities that have like sort of larger Korean or Asian populations, and it's basically like a, a Korean supermarket. So a lot of the Korean imports that you can't get at a regular supermarket are you can be can be found at this this grocery store. And yeah, after my Mom died. Um, you know, like most people who are grieving are told to do. I I went to therapy for a, a few months, and I was working a nine to five job uh, that was really soulless. And I would take the train to Union Square and pay like a hundred dollar copay to talk to someone for half an hour. Um, and I felt like I had a cold hard look at myself and was like, "Is if you spent this copay?" On just like a bunch of groceries or like a really nice lunch, like would that be more <laughs> healing for you uh, than this experience? And ultimately, I decided to mm -hmm. learn how to cook Korean food, um, and found that when I went to this grocery store, it was sort of unlocking these memories of my mother before she got sick because. I moved out of my parents' house when I was 18 to go to college. So the last sort of concentrated period of time I spent with my mother was when she was sick. And so for a long time, it was very difficult to remember her um, before she was ill. And that was really heartbreaking for me. And so once I started going to H Mart and sort of seeing all these different things that she used to make for me when I was a kid or different foods of hers that were her favorite, it sort of began to unlock um sort of break through this like cloud of trauma and, and remind me of um, mm. sort of happier times. And so I found that really comforting and, and I wound up going to H Mart uh, very frequently for, for that year. You capture so beautifully in the book how, how what we eat really ties us to a particular culture. I mean, I can really relate to that. My mum always cooked um, amazing Albanian food. Um, and especially while I was living in London, when I'd left Kosovo, that was the thing that always brought me back to, I don't know, connecting me to my the Kosovan side of my identity. And you just express it so well, how, how food and cooking is seen as a gesture of care um, and that how that was like that connective tissue between you and your mother. And in fact, you ask in the opening pages of the book, when you're literally crying in, in H Mart following your mother's death, saying... Am I even Korean anymore if there's no one left to call and ask which brand of seaweed we used to buy? Why is food such an important theme in the book? When my mom got sick um, and, and went through chemotherapy, especially I think as an only child, as an only daughter, um, when I found out she was sick, it was very important to me to become um this like sort of exceptional primary caretaker to kind of repay um, the debts uh, of of being an only daughter of an only child. And a big part of that, I think a very primal part of that is wanting to uh, like feed the mother that fed you. Um, mm. But Korean food is, is very extreme. It's very, it's often like bright red. It's very spicy. It's very flavorful. It's very salty. And that's the food that I grew up eating and that I really love and, and that I was taught to eat and make. And when my mom got sick and was unable to sort of eat all of these foods, I realized there was a huge, um, like cultural divide between us where I, I never learned what the foods that you eat when you're ill or you're older, or you can't digest mm. things well. 
um, what like a Korean sick person eats. Cause like when you go to a Korean restaurant or you eat at home and you're not sick, you don't really eat those foods very often. And there was a woman, my mother's good friend who came to live with us and sort of took over that role. And I think I felt like such a failure after my mother died that I wasn't sort of able to fulfill that role that I think part of it, I later realized in the process of writing this book was this kind of psychological undoing of that of that sense of failure of of connecting mm. to um this sort of cultural knowledge that I I didn't have and I couldn't offer uh to her at that time. Um but I also think that it's just such a, you know, it's a, a sensual memory that all of us have uh very clearly. It's sort of one of our first memories of what foods we shared with our family and with our friends and um it was an easy sort of access point to that part of my heritage and that memory of my mother uh, to get back in touch with. And I think for the book, it was also a really great way to outline it. It, it offered some sort of lightness uh, to a book that I knew was going to be very dark and very heavy at times. And, and it allowed me to kind of lean into um, a different type of writing when, when that got sort of too dark. I mean, speaking about uh, the writing, you know, within six months of your mother being diagnosed with cancer, you found yourself without a mother unemployed, newly married and estranged from your father. And I guess that's so much to, to process. And you talk a lot um, in the book and, and you're talking now about how much learning to cook Korean dishes helped make you feel closer to your mother and help you process the grief. But I'm, what, I'm wondering what extent was writing Crying in H Mart? How did that help? Um, and I know, you know, the story began as an essay in The New Yorker, but did you always know that that there was more to tell, that you were going to write a full book. By the time I wrote the essay for The New Yorker, I had started what I thought might be a book. Um, but before that, maybe two years before that, I wrote another essay. Um, and I think in the process of writing that essay, I, which was a much sort of like lighthearted attempt at, at telling the story, uh, I realized that there was such a, a bigger story to tell and that there was a lot of um, unpacking to do sort of emotionally uh, that I could that could not be accomplished through song songwriting like there there just wasn't enough real estate to explore um, this particular experience and yeah I mean it was a really difficult process um, but it was also so healing in so many ways I feel like I, was able to really um, understand my mother uh, in a much deeper way and understand our relationship mm. and sort of find forgiveness for a lot of the people in my life, including myself. And I think that in order to kind of write what I felt like would be a successful memoir in the sense of just like what is a fair story to tell, what is a, a good and like challenging story to tell as if, if – um, you know, it felt like all sides were being represented. And in order to do that, you sort of have to challenge yourself to have this kind of radical empathy where you're not only like revealing truths about the people around you, but finding uh, what your faults are and exposing them as well and providing as much context as possible. And I think it forced me to um, have empathy for and, and relate to people that maybe I I didn't at the, in the beginning of, of the telling of this book. Did you feel like it was... Uh difficult decision to share so much of your personal relationships like I guess it's the writer's dilemma isn't it you know uh, to tell an authentic story you kind of have to share more than you're comfortable with uh, sometimes so I'm just wondering it's such a personal relationship and you're so honest which is what makes it so beautiful but I'm, I'm wondering how, how difficult was that for you I feel like that is just like the type of um artist I've always been like I think that I almost mm. feel like I can't all I have to offer is that type of honesty and it's what I almost feel the most comfortable with and it was sort of while I was writing the book um if there were moments of pause where I was like am I accidentally perpetuating some kind of negative stereotype or am I like revealing too much I I kept kind of going back to like well how can it be wrong if it's just honest and if it's as fairly presented as possible and as it's honestly presented as possible and 
uh, then then how can it sort of be wrong? I mean, there were certainly moments of pause in, in, cert in different parts of the book that I had. And actually, Peter had really wonderful advice while I was writing, which was just to write it and sort of decide later if that was something that I wanted to, to share. And, and more often than not, it was something after... Um, you know, editing and sitting on it and returning to it was something that I felt uh, was the most important to share. I think oftentimes the most sort of the things that bring you the most fear uh, are the things that uh, people are the most excited to to finally get to read because it's something that's some, somewhat taboo or, or somewhat strange or someone's dying to, to relate to someone about. And so it felt important to me to include um, all of those details in the book. And um, yeah, I mean, I knew right away that was a really important part of my relationship with my mother. I think that in a way it was like me proving that even though our relationship was so tumultuous at times, um, that there was like a, a real deep love between us. I mean, it was like an inexplicably profound connection that the two of us had. And I think most daughters and mothers have that kind of like, I mean, we can be so evil to one another but we can also mm. um we also have this this completely unparalleled bond I, I i feel like you you live such a duality in life both as an author and a musician and i guess that honesty and the vulnerability is what maybe ties the two but how different is japanese breakfast michelle to author michelle i feel like author michelle is like smarter and more like sober <laughs> um yeah i feel like like the japanese breakfast self is just like more um i don't know it's like a more intuitive uh part part of me uh i think i the the hat that i wear as a writer is, is something that's a bit more uh considered and and uh, uh serious maybe but i think so both of my personas are like kind of slightly slightly more wholesome than i actually am <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, you tell us in the book that your mum wasn't happy with you being in a band and telling you after your first gig, I'm just waiting for you to give this up. Like today, you're a Grammy nominated artist. Your book is a New York Times bestseller. It was on Barack Obama's favorite books of 2021. How do you imagine your mum would have responded to your success today? I mean, undoubtedly, she would have been very very proud of you but how do you think she would have expressed that um i think she would have expressed it in a couple of ways i mean deep down i think she would be extremely proud of me and i so wish that she could could see it but um i think mm. that she would say where is my bag um <laughs> i i think she would expect me to have bought her like a luxury bag at this point that would be like the first thing right on on the list <laughs> but then i think she you know like any mom she's like oh so constantly like pressuring she would constantly be pressuring me for for more, you know, like, oh, you got nominated right. for Grammy, but it's not like you won. <laughs> so what's next? How are we going to do better? Right. It's yeah. kind of, that's, so, that's right, right. so funny. So there's a film version of Crying in H Mart, but you've been quite involved in um, the screenwriting process as well as writing the score. I feel like in some ways, like your music career is intertwining um, with your writing career, like, what can you tell us about the film and like, how's that process been like for you? It must be quite different to see it kind of in a, in a visual sense or it might start to imagine it in that way. I wrote the script and it went through a, a few revisions and it was a really fun process. I mean, I studied film in college, film and writing, and um, it's, it's a medium I'm really passionate about and it was a real, I, I really love to learn about new mediums and like to find my voice within them. And so I really enjoyed that element of, of, of bringing it together and, and finding the voices of characters of people that you know really well and sort of telling parts of the story that maybe didn't really get to be told in, in the book and, and revisiting it. Um, but it was also kind of hard to, it was the first time that I sort of retold the story, uh, in, in a different medium and, it was really odd to like have to collaborate so intensely with with so many different people um it's just such a different totally. industry um that i think that it made me you know i mean it's it's a really interesting industry to have insight into but it also made me really appreciative of like how much smaller uh in a way the world of music and um publishing can be compared to this like completely mm. gigantic monster but i think that that's what's so appealing about that industry is that it's kind of the 
the top of the artistic mountain where like everyone uh, sort of can engage with this medium in a way that um, maybe not everyone can with music and 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 uh, books. Okay, so now as we wrap up, I have to ask you some more questions about food. Like I, I told you, I was obsessed. And if I were to visit your apartment, what kind of food and snacks would I find in your kitchen cupboards? And do you finally have the right seaweed? <laughs> I don't have the right seaweed, actually. And I thought it might be easier in Korea, but now it's kind of like mixed up because there's just like even more options uh, at the grocery store. So I keep buying the wrong seaweed. <laughs> um, my cupboard is really different right now because I'm living in Seoul. They have very bizarre Mexican food here. So okay. you can't really buy like cans of beans very readily. So like weirdly, I have like dried beans in my cupboard, which is not something that I would generally have <laughs> in the U.S. Um, but yeah, it's also really great because we live right next to this sort of outdoor old school market um, called Mangwon Shijang. And uh, so we're able to like buy all sorts of like kimchi and different kinds of banchan and like lots of um, small like vegetable side dishes and uh, mm. like marinated meats from this from this little market. So it's very it's a very sweet thing to get to like converse with all of the old ladies and like buy shellfish from them and, and different vegetables and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's nice being like five, a five minute walk from there. What's on your tour rider? I'm curious what's on your tour rider. It's hard because like the things that you want, like you don't want them every day. Actually, one thing that our saxophone yeah. player um, requests that's like local sourdough bread from like specific bakeries. Oh, and that's sending cool. them in like a few days before we're in the city. I normally I ask for like a local <laughs> hot sauce oh on my, my rider. I love um, the spicier the better for me. So that's like a big one. And then the wow. rest is really simple. It's like veggie sticks and hummus and some ginger shots and juices and then crisps. Oh yeah, ginger shots. I've got friends coming over for dinner this weekend. And after this conversation, I'm feeling inspired. What are some easy Korean dishes that you think I could make at home? I feel like tteokbokki is pretty easy to make. I'm obsessed. Yeah, in the market, this is like a, they have these like really fat ones. They're called kare tteok and like they're basically just like twice the width and like length uh, of the of the ones that you usually get and so i usually just like bake those and, and eat them with like uh sesame oil and um soy sauce but i feel like if you're having friends over tteokbokki is like a really easy thing to make and it's like nice and spicy and good with drinks yeah okay i gotta do that <laughs> um michelle thank you so much for joining me good luck in seoul um i can't wait to read what what eventually you know, comes out this year for you. Um, and for those who are listening, who want even more, we have a playlist and we have a reading list for you on service95.com, um, which we're really, really grateful for. Michelle, thank you so much. Um, it's been so lovely having you. And thank you for crying in HMART. Thank you for your honesty um, and for putting so much of yourself out there for us to, to read and connect with. Um, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading it and for having me.